previously. All right. Uh, I, whoa. <laughs> okay. Something just popped. <laughs> I still see a little bit of smoke. There's nothing on fire. All right, well, I don't see any obvious signs of damage, and I don't think the fuse is blue, but from the fact that the smoke was coming out from here, sort of coming out from under this uh, hole, uh, the only things that are there is you can sort of see those transistors mounted over here. There are three of them. So I suspect that maybe one of them blew, but the other weird thing is that there was a clear spark, um, and that would sort of imply that, you know, maybe there was a loose wire in there. So uh, what I'm gonna do is see if I can get under here. Now I know that uh, this entire monitor thing can be removed. So here we can see the back of the machine where the monitor sits. And this is actually a module that can be pulled out. There are two bolts here and here, which basically hold this whole uh, slidey thing uh, up against these rails. So if I remove these two bolts, I can just pull the entire module out and take a look at it. So here we're looking down at the top of the monitor, and we can see that there appears to be um, probably a greenish kind of uh, plastic transparency and a reddish plastic transparency on the bottom. So it's also very, very dusty. Uh, people are probably yelling at me right now saying that I just put scratches in the transparency because you should never do that. Um, anyway, I will probably just clean this up with a little bit of uh, a damp cloth um, and then mark where these lines are just in case the transparency comes off so that I can put the transparency back in the right place. Okay, that's looking a little better now that all the dust is off. Let me just put a mark where the red goes. Okay, that way if the thing comes off, I can put the red cover back. Um, the transparency seems to be held on by, uh, I guess, just glue. Yeah, actually, it looks like um, double-sided tape, almost. So. Um, I may just refresh that because, you know, I don't know, why not? Now that this is tipped over carefully, because we don't want to break the glass, uh, we can see the driver circuitry over here, the high voltage circuitry over here, and uh, I'm definitely going to discharge the CRT before actually getting in here and working on this. Um, what I'm going to do... Uh, this is nice because the transistors that are heat synced onto the uh, sheet metal are connected using, you know, just uh, pluggable connectors. So I can remove those and uh, take this out and check to see if any components are damaged or if any fuses blew. Uh, with the plugs unplugged, I can also check the transistors out to see if any of those went bad and were the cause of the smoke. Okay, so I have a wire hooked up to a screwdriver, which I'm going to use to get into the anode and just touch it. Okay. So no sparks, no nothing. So I'm pretty sure that the CRT is discharged. Great, so now I can remove the PCB. 
So first things first, uh, we have some plugs back here. So this is a plug that goes to, let's see, there are two transformers actually for this plug. Uh, this one also two, tran two uh, transistors. All right, and then we have, uh, this is the input plug right here. And then we have another plug right over here, which seems to go to the, um, to the neck, which controls the heater filament and the gun, the electron gun. And it also goes to the high voltage supply. So I'm gonna remove this. And we finally have another plug that goes to what appears to be, I think that's called the yoke. All right, so now we have this ready to go. So I am going to, let's see. We've got some hex nuts here. So I can remove those. And there we go, the PCB. So let's inspect this and see what we can find. So here's the board. Um, I've inspected it and everything looks fine. Uh, none of the fuses look bad. They all seem to be intact. And I don't see any burn marks anywhere or any indication of smoke damage. So I'm willing to bet that there's probably nothing wrong with this board, at least nothing particularly physical wrong with this board that would cause that sort of sparking behavior. Now the sparks uh, appeared to come, let's see, I think the board was oriented like this. No, it's oriented like this because these plugs are where the transistor, uh, these are where the transistors plug into. And it seemed to me like uh, the sparks were coming from this top area over here, which is where the transistors were heat sunk or heat synced. Let's see. Ah, there is possibly a mark here. I'm going to take a look a little closer at that. Okay, well, as we can see, this is a close up of the burn mark, and we can definitely see some evidence of blowout basically here. So you sort of see that uh, the, the smoke sort of traveled in that direction, um, basically from the pin outwards, and it even looks like the corner over here basically got vaporized. Now you see this cracking around the solder joint I think what we've got is a loose solder joint, which caused that spark. So I'm just gonna grab the pin and wiggle it. Yep, it's totally loose. So what we've got here is a dry solder joint, um, which was apparently so dry that when power went through it, uh, it basically cracked, um, or maybe it was cracked to begin with and caused a spark. So I'm going to go ahead and re-solder that. And I'm also going to look at some of these other solder joints like this one. This one's also loose, so that's not good. All right, I've given the circuit board a good going over with solder and IPA. Everything looks pretty nice and shiny and all of these connections seem pretty solid. Uh, I did notice one thing, which is, uh, let's see, this capacitor here, I noticed that it was a bit wobbly. And when I looked at the bottom of the circuit board, it's gonna be a little hard to see. Let's see where that is. I 
think it's right there. So if I wiggle, if I wiggle it, I don't know if you can see, but that is also wiggling. So I applied a little bit of um, extra solder on there. So hopefully that will not break. Oh, and we can't forget to check these transistors. Hmm. I seem to have a short circuit, possibly. I'm going to take a closer look. Well, it's actually a pretty good thing that I remembered to check the transistors. So here are two transistors over here, and you can see a third one sort of peeking over there, and there's a fourth one underneath this bar. Uh, this is uh, the wire harness that just goes to the transistors, and I can simply use my multimeter in diode measuring mode and check to make sure that we see diode junctions. So for example, here is one of the diode junctions. So it's showing 0.56 volts. And the other way, it's also showing 0.56 volts. And if I swap the leads, if I swap the leads, I get nothing which is what diodes are supposed to do. Nothing. So that's one transistor. Here's another transistor. 0 0.57, 0 0.57, and if I reverse the leads, nothing and nothing. So these two transistors are good. Let's move over to the other two transistors. Okay, here are, here is one transistor and here is the other, and here is the plug that goes to them. Now I simply connect zero volts, zero volts, that's not good. And even with the leads reversed, I get zero volts. And with the other transistor, zero volts, and zero volts. So basically both the junctions on these transistors are shot. So we've got two bad transistors and two good transistors. So what I'm gonna to have to do is get a replacement for these two transistors and solder them in. Okay, so these are the offending transistors. The 2N3715 is an NPN power transistor, and the 2N3792 is a PNP power transistor. And it's going to be one of these two pairs. They come in pairs. One of them drives the X yoke, and one of them drives the Y yoke, so the X position and Y position of the electron beam or the deflection of the electron beam. Now, the real question is, why exactly did these things spark? Um, one possibility is that they were already bad and that the spark didn't actually cause these to fail, but was actually a result of these failing. Because if these were basically shorts, then effectively the full current uh, going through these transistors would be applied, causing uh, sparks. And there was a blowout, and the blowout basically shut off the current. Uh, the other possibility is that the driver of these transistors is bad. So what I should do is check all of these transistors to make sure that they're not blown. I'm pretty sure they're fine, but I will check them again anyway. In the meantime, I do have to order spares of these. I think I'll just order two of each. Uh, just in case, you know, I blow out a pair again because I didn't properly diagnose the problem. So that's what I'll be doing. All right, I've finally gotten my transistors in. So these are the bad ones. And I've got the good ones in here and here, one NPN and one PNP. These were pretty expensive. They were uh, a little over $7 a piece. Uh, in any case, I got two of each. Um, there are also these mica insulators. Uh, so this would 
fit over the transistor like this. And it goes up against the metal of the case. So it's an insulator, basically. Um, actually, this would go the other way, wouldn't it? Yeah, like that. So um, I could reuse these, but they do tend to sort of break. And rather than, rather than risk having them break, I just bought a bag of them. I hope they're the right size. Let's see. Okay, I bought a bag of a bag of them. And I could only get them in bags of 200. <laughs> so uh, anyway, I'm pretty sure this is the right size. Um, it's, uh, well, it's, it's slightly bigger, but that's okay. It doesn't really matter. As long as it fits over the transistor properly. Whoops, the other way. And the holes line up, that's good enough. So that's an insulator right there. All right, so I've got my insulators and I also have heat sink compound. Um, they used some white heat sink compound and I also got some white heat sink compound. Uh, that just gets smeared all over the place. Um, it feels like they've applied it on mainly the bottom side of the transistor, but um, there was also some on the metal case. So anyway, so I have that. So what I'm going to do now is just uh, replace these transistors. I'm going to check the coils that the transistors are attached to. Let's see. So in this diagram, if you can see it, uh, hopefully, uh, there's the coil right there and there are the transistors. So there's the coil and there are the transistors. Um, when I say coil, I mean the um, they call it, I guess, the yoke, and it goes over the neck of the CRT, and its purpose is to apply a magnetic field to deflect the electron beam. So one is the X and one is the Y. Uh, so I just want to make sure that those aren't uh, like uh, open circuit. And then we'll see. Here's where I'm going to put the transistors. The 3715 goes here. And the 3792 goes here. Um, looking at the other transistors, it does kind of seem that uh, they put the insulator on first, like so, and then they put the uh, heat sink compound because I'm actually looking at this and I, there's a little bit of heat sink compound in there. And there's also a tiny speck of dirt that's about to go into the hole, which I don't really want that to happen. So I'm just going to grab that thing. Okay, great. Uh, so what I'm going to do is I am definitely going to put the heat sink compound on maybe the transistor. So just put a squirt there, put a squirt there. It's probably good enough. And now put it in the right way. So first I will take the insulator, put it like that. That just doesn't seem right to me somehow. Um, cause you know, well, I guess with, um, with the insulator being here, I guess, uh, it's not electrically connected to the case and I have no idea what, what the insulator does for heat transfer. So anyway, I'm just going to do it like that. Yeah. Actually, now that I'm looking at this as it's installed, it does pretty much look like this other one in that the heat sink compound is coming out from under the transistor, but it's not coming out from under the insulator. So I guess that's okay. All right, now this is the screw. 
that holds the transistor in place and also serves as one of the terminals as well. Because there is no electrical connection between the case and the transistor, and there cannot be, otherwise the transistor would short out. Um, this goes directly into the socket. Here is the other one, and did you see where my other insulator went? So now, back inside here, I need to reattach the uh, circuit board, but first what I want to do is go into these connectors here and make sure that I am seeing the junction diodes. Uh, and that'll also tell me whether I've connected up the uh, transistor to its socket properly. All right, let's have a look. So I know that it's grouped um, by three wires, so I'm just going to check, say, the first wire and the second wire. No, I'll reverse the leads then. All right, and the other junction, good. And the other transistor, let's see, black, lead will go in the middle. No, nope. did I get that backwards? Oh wait, it's a PNP, so the junction is reversed, so the red lead goes in the middle. Great. All right, the junctions are in. Excellent. All right, I've screwed these in, um, and interestingly, uh, the other side doesn't have screws, but it has these sort of spring clips, and it looks like you just sort of push the circuit board onto those spring clips. Kind of like that. I guess you just, there we go. All right, that's pretty secure. So here we are looking up inside the machine. This is that cardboard bezel. These are the side windows that uh, spectators can view the game on. And uh, it looks like these are actually screwed from the inside. So I might just remove them and clean them from the inside. Actually, I think I'm just going to leave those windows in. Uh, they're just acrylic, they're not glass, and uh, I can clean them from the inside. I don't have to remove them. So, the, uh, the face area was particularly dirty. So again, we're looking into the machine from the back. These are the windows, and the reason I've taken the camera off is to tilt up, and you can see that there is actually a mirror. It's at a 45 degree angle, so that whoever is looking in will get the light bounced off that mirror and go down into the monitor, which faces upwards like that. So I will clean the mirror as well. Okay, so I have the camera looking up into the monitor that way, looking at the board that failed before. And now I am going to plug the thing in. So I'm just checking the uh, safety interlocks to make sure that they are both closed so that all I have to do is flip the switch in the back here 
And now I'm just going to plug it in and turn it on and see what happens. Here we go. So what happened was uh, I bumped one of the uh, safety switches and turned the thing off. So now with all the safety switches closed, let's turn this on and see what happens. All right. So far so good. I do see that the spot suppression LED is on, which means that there is no signal. So that means that there should be no display. If there's no display, then it's likely that the problem is now with the logic boards. So I guess that's the next thing to look at. So I've had to make this totally ridiculous table out of a couple boxes and a piece of plywood uh, because that was really the only way that I could get the uh, logic boards out of the machine and place them flat in an accessible area uh, because of all these cables, the way they're, the way they're routed. So, uh, and because the switch is now under the table, uh, I'm just going to turn the machine on by pulling on one of the safety interlocks. I've got my oscilloscope sitting over here, and I think the first thing that I'm going to do is, um, there are a couple of test points, more than a couple. There's a whole bunch of test points all around these boards. Um, now, this is what's called the auxiliary board, and this is the main board. It's the one with the 6502. Um, and I was looking here and I see, uh, let's see if I can focus in on these test points. Let me zoom out a little bit. Yeah, so there's a test point, let's see. There's various, uh, there's a ground point here. There's another ground point here. Uh, let's see, there's something called VROM2, VROM3, and ROM, and VROM1. These are all active low. And I guess those are to enable the various video ROMs. Um, let's see, ah, this board is called a 6502A analog vector generator. Copyright Atari, 79 and 80. Uh, okay, here is a test point called 1.5 megahertz. Uh, I think that is the clock that goes into the 6502. Let's see, uh, here's a crystal. The crystal is 12.096 megahertz. Uh, so that's definitely one important thing to check, that the processor is actually getting a clock. Obviously, you know, you'd want to check the voltages as well, which we probably should. Um, let's see, here is a five volt test point, and here's something called WD-DIS. Uh, I don't know what that means at this point, but I'll figure that out. Here is a test point called HALT, um, and here's a bunch of test points for the audio circuitry, which uh, no, that's not the audio circuitry. This is the um, vector uh, output circuitry. We've got an X center test point, a Y out test point. That's nice. Another ground. We've got negative 15 volts and plus 5 volts DAC. Um, that's, uh, that's actually interesting. So there's uh, some silk screen over here that says Y center. Uh, I just realized that the video part is not in frame. There we go. Okay. So here's the video output section of the board. We have a test point called X center here. Uh, we've got, let's see, Y out, ground, minus 15 volts, plus 5 volts DAC, plus 15 volts, and X out. Um, 
So X out and Y out presumably just go right to the, the, the monitor uh, board. Uh, this X center is kind of, oh, that's not actually X center, that's actually ground. Uh, X center looks to be, it looks like there's room for a potentiometer here. There's another uh, silk screen here that says Y center, and there's another spot for a potentiometer. Um, close to those are other potentiometers, so maybe that's what those are. Um, this potentiometer here says X bip, <laughs> and this potentiometer here says Y bip, I guess. Maybe I'm reading that wrong. Um, so anyway, and here I think is a button labeled reset. So uh, with all these test points, um, oh, here is a test point called V center uh, or V counter, probably video counter. Um, I should probably look at the schematic before I go trying to interpret these. Uh, let's see, here's a test point for minus, for plus 12 volts, and here is a test point for minus 5 volts. So, the first thing I can do is test the voltages. So, let's go ahead and put this, let's see, here's a good spot for it. Put this on volts. Great. That looks pretty good. So, uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take uh, the oscilloscope probe and do something pretty hokey here. And that is I'm going to simply attach the, the probe. This is very hokey. So I attach the probe uh, to the ground point along with the voltmeter. Okay. Um, well, let's turn this on, I hope it doesn't blow up, and just take a look at some of these voltages over here. All right, it's on. Everything looks pretty good. We've got the, uh, the LED, which is unfortunately off screen over there. Let's see if I can rotate the screen a little bit. It's really hard to get everything in frame. Maybe just zoom out slightly. Okay, I think uh, hopefully you can see that there is the LED over there. Uh, so we're going to test the plus five volt rail. 5.08 volts, that's pretty good. Um, and then the rest is just for the analog circuitry. Uh, which we're not really going to test, but we'll just look at the voltages. So this is minus 5. It's giving off minus 5.2. Uh, this is plus 5 for the DAC, which is 4.9. Uh, this is plus 15. Plus 15. Uh, this is minus 15. Minus 15, and again, plus five for the DAC. Okay, so that looks pretty good. Um, great. So all the voltages check out. The next thing that I'm gonna do is I'm gonna hook up the probe to this 1.5 megahertz clock signal. Let's see what we're getting. So conveniently, we have a ground lug right next to it. And I have to be a little bit careful because there are rails. Uh, this isn't like covered in, um, this isn't covered in um, solder mask. So all of these silvery traces are conductive. All right, so let's go ahead and zoom out and take a look at the oscilloscope output. Okay, there's the oscilloscope output. We can see that we are getting a nice square wave. And if we hit measure, and I can read that off, we get a Vmax of 4.16 volts. And where's the frequency? There we go, frequency, 1.515 megahertz, which is close enough. So. We definitely have a clock over there. Um, here's a read-write signal. Let's see if we're actually executing things. 
Well, it does kind of look like we're, we're reading and writing, uh, or at least doing something. So we've got a waveform. Uh, let's see, here's another test point for phase two. Uh, that, I think, is the clock input. Yep, that's uh, 1.515. That is uh, one of the uh, phase clocks that goes into the 6502. So I'm pretty sure that the thing is executing. Let's take a look at uh, this VROM. Uh, VROM1. Okay. All right. Well, I thought I saw something. Maybe what I could do is attempt to capture... Ah, there we go. All right. So we are getting bursts of activity. Yeah, we're definitely getting bursts. Yep. There we go. Okay. Uh, maybe I should just look at the screen and see if anything is happening. No, nothing is happening on the screen. So now the interesting question is, I'm seeing activity on the video ROMs. Uh, am I seeing any activity out of the video circuitry itself? So let's go ahead and probe. Well, there's X out and Y out. Uh, that's good enough to tell me whether there is anything being output. So, uh, let's see, where is ground? Ground is right here. There's one ground here and one ground here. Yeah, okay. Uh, what I want to measure is, okay, so there's Y out. And where's X out? X out is over there. So I think, um, I think I'm just going to use this ground lug here and measure Y out. Okay, so let's see. I don't see any activity. Change the scale just in case it's a small signal. Well, I see some spikes. Well, I see the occasional spike. But there are very low signals. Let's see if uh, I'm getting anything out of X out. And again, I'm just seeing a few uh, very small, short spikes out of X out. Let me just hit reset just for fun. Yeah, okay, no change. So let's see, there's this auxiliary board, which uh, presumably does something, and I'm not entirely certain what. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to look at the schematic and see what exactly is between the processor and the video output, because there's probably a problem between the two somewhere. Uh, so that's going to be the next step. So I have the schematics, and really the big problem with a board like this is that You've got uh, essentially a computerized portion and then the logic portion. 
And I don't know whether the program is actually executing properly. Uh, we've got the ROMs here. We've got some RAM scattered throughout the boards. Uh, it looks like there are two RAM chips in one location and something like uh, six or seven in another location. Uh, the RAM chips are 2114s, uh, and I've kind of heard that sometimes 2114s can go bad um, and that you can replace them. Uh, so, you know, unless the ROMs are actually bad and the RAMs are actually bad, I'm fairly certain that the program is executing properly. Because remember, again, we did see bursts of activity uh, when we accessed the video ROM. Um, so the other possibility is that there's a problem with uh, some of the logic that feeds into the video generator. So what I can probably do is work backwards from the video generator and tap off each chip using a little clip-on device and take a look at the signals for that chip and make sure that those signals do correspond to the chip's function. In other words, say if I have an AND gate, well, I want to monitor the two inputs of the AND gate and the output of the AND gate and then just look at all the combinations and make sure that the chip is actually doing what it's supposed to. In other words, an AND function. So that's probably what I'm going to do. Um, I'm going to buy some 2114 RAMs uh, just in case there uh, actually is a problem with these RAMs. I'm also going to have to put together a circuit that basically tests a 2114. So that's the next step. So I was just uh, probing around the circuit board uh, to take a look at some of the output signals, the analog output signal. And all of a sudden the machine started making a faint buzzing noise. So I went to the front and I see something on the screen. It's, uh, it's obviously sort of working. Uh, the text is skewed but at least you can see that things are actually sort of working. So I would say that uh, the computer board is probably working fine. That is the, the computerized program. Um, the logic probably is fine. So really all I need to do is uh, Maybe adjust, looks like the y-axis possibly. So that's pretty cool. Yeah. I'm not really sure why those things are jumping around or if they're supposed to jump around. Oh, that was a target reticle. Yeah, it's like um, something is intermittent here, so I'm going to have to do some further debugging. I don't know why this suddenly started working, though. Uh, it's a bit of a worry. I was just basically probing on one of the output op amps. Uh, I was actually probing on the input, uh, which is the thing that just comes out of the DAC on the X and Y. And all of a sudden, and then I turned it on and the machine started to work. So I'm going to have to figure that one out. And also apparently it's set to German. So yeah, here is uh, my setup. The machine is actually uh, currently running. And this is the output from, uh, well, I'm not quite sure which output it is. I suspect it's the Y output, or rather the input just before, let's see if we can find it here. Um, it's the output of the DAC, which comes here. And that goes into the input of this op amp, which then goes to this, um, amplifier over here and then goes to the Y out signal. 
So what you're seeing over here is basically the uh, Y vector signal. Now in theory, I guess, I could hook up the, uh, the X on the other channel and uh, put it on uh, XY mode and actually see the vectors come out on this. So uh, that would be kind of interesting to do. Again, it was a bit worrying um, that it just suddenly worked. Let's take a closer look at the probe point. Sorry for the camera shake, but um, let's see if I can, yeah. Okay, so that brown thing that you're seeing in the middle of the screen, uh, that is a capacitor that apparently has been put between ground and the input to the op amp. Uh, it doesn't appear on the schematics. It appears to be uh, a later add-on because it's soldered soldered directly to the chip, which is weird. Anyway, I bent it up a little bit, and I bent the, uh, the other one, uh, this one right here, for the other axis. I just bent it a little bit. Um, and then as I was probing it, all of a sudden it just started working. So, you know, I'm wondering if uh, these capacitors are actually bad, whether they should be there in the first place. Um, I'm not really sure why they're there. But anyway, that's what I found out. All right, so uh, let's put this in XY mode and see what happens. So apparently the menu is here, time base, XY. All right, well, obviously there is something there but it just looks like a bunch of dots because um, I guess we're not looking at the sweep so how do I uh, it's SA rate I don't know time base trigger offset yeah there's not there's not much else so I can't really tell what's going on here yeah I can't really see what's going on. Let's go to... Yeah, all right, well, it was worth the experiment. What I really wanted to see is, uh, was the distortion caused by the, the monitor board, or is the distortion actually inherent in uh, the analog circuitry? So clearly some adjustment needs to be done. I just don't know where it does need to be done. Okay, so taking a look at the screen again, we can see that I'm pretty sure that the X is working just fine. So I think we can troubleshoot this down to the Y axis. And I'll show you why when we get the Battle Zone logo. See how it sort of jumps up now, this is supposed to be a smooth crawl, I'm pretty sure. So what this says to me is that there's something digital going on. Uh, I'm almost positive it's something digital because uh, if it were analog, you wouldn't get those, those jumps. So it's possible that one of the lines to the DAC is not being set properly. Um, maybe some of, the, um, some of the lines aren't being set or stuck, or something. So that's the hypothesis that I'm going to go with. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm probably going to maybe clip onto, well, I don't know if clipping onto the DAC chip is going to help me, um, but I can definitely look at each of the signals to see if, um, you know, at, at least they're all, you know, toggling. Uh, for all I know, it's the DAC chip itself. 
Okay, so we've determined that there's something wrong with the y-axis. So here is the schematic for the x and y axes, uh, the outputs. So we've got y out over here, and we've got x out over here. So we're going to look at the y coordinate right here. And what I want to do is look at the inputs for the digital to analog converter. Uh, again, the reason that I think it's uh, something to do with the data lines that are going into it is because there are jumps uh, in the video stream in the Y input, so uh, the Y output. So I don't think it's any of these components on the output. So it's got to be a digital issue somewhere. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take a little uh, clip and clip it onto this chip and then look at each of the signals and see if they are toggling or doing things. Okay, so this is the chip that I'm interested in, um, and this is a dip clip. Now, this is a 20-pin chip, and unfortunately, I only have a clip for an 18-pin chip. Uh, so I won't be able to look at all the signals uh, without actually moving this thing. But basically, it just sits right on there, just like that. So now I have these pins available and I will use the oscilloscope to look at some of the signals. So according to the schematic um, and with reference to the data sheet here, uh, what they've done is they've tied pin one to ground uh, and that is the most significant bit uh, this is apparently, the numbering is backwards, which is kind of unfortunate. It's backwards from convention. Um, usually, you know, like B0 would be the least significant bit. So anyway, you've got all of these bits all the way up to B11 and B12, B12 being the least significant bit. So they've tied this to ground. So what that means is basically they're using this chip, but they're getting rid of basically half the, uh, half the range. Uh, okay, so the first signal that I'm going to look at is the uh, next most significant bit, uh, which is B2. So that will basically tell us whether we're seeing a signal on the top of the screen or the bottom of the screen. So let's turn the machine on. And I've got the oscilloscope going and hooked up. All right, so we obviously see signals. Let's uh, increase this a bit. Yeah, so, I mean, there's obviously signals here, right? Oops, I just hit auto. That wasn't great. Yeah, so there's an example signal. There's another example signal. And here's, wow, here's a whole bunch of data. Um, so the timing on this is, um, it looks almost like uh, about the smallest pulse that I see is something like five microseconds or less. Anyway, let's move on to the next bit down. Okay, and we do see signals there. The next bit, signals, next, signals, next, signals. So, so far so good. Next, signals, next, signals, and this is now B10. I'm seeing signals, okay, B11, signals, and B12. Uh, that is B12, and I'm not seeing any signals whatsoever. Let me just wait a little while.
Oh, and B12 is grounded. Okay, so they grounded B12 as well. So out of the uh, 12 bits, they're only actually using 10. But uh, we have seen data on all 10 bits. Now, just in case I've got my X's and my Y's backwards, or you know, if maybe the coordinate system is the opposite of what I think it is, um, I'm going to clip onto the X chip and take a look at some of its signals. I'm off by one. There we go. All right, and um, in terms of the, uh, the X, let's see. I think this, no, this is the X, right? So it goes, yeah, it's the same thing. So the top and bottom bits are grounded. So uh, one bit here. Looks fine. Second bit looks fine. Third bit looks fine. Fourth bit, fine. Fifth, fine. Sixth, good. Seventh, good. Eighth, good. Ninth, good. Tenth bit, good. And the other bit would be grounded. So it appears that the inputs to the chip are fine but it looks like the output to the chip is not good. So what I suspect is that maybe it's the chip that's bad. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna order uh, a new replacement. Uh, that might take a little while to come in uh, and then just desolder this and uh, replace it with the new one and see what happens. Here's the block diagram for the digital to analog converter. Basically, the idea is that you feed a reference current into this pin, um, provided that this pin is sort of grounded. Uh, there are other configurations, but we're just going to deal with the configuration as it is in the machine. The negative voltage is connected to minus 15 volts, and the positive voltage is set to 5 volts. And uh, we have also the outputs. Now I've connected the um, negative current output to ground, as it is in the machine, and the positive current output to 1K. Uh, notice that the current is actually going in. So basically what happens is, depending on uh, the digital pattern that you put on the inputs, you will get some multiple of the reference. Now, if we look at the equation that they give in the data sheet, we can see that the full scale reference, or the full scale reading, I should say, is 4,095, which is the largest number you can put in, divided by 4,096 times four times the reference current that you put in, which is about 3.999 times the reference current. Now you can see that I've used a 15K resistor and a 15 volt supply to give me one milliamp of reference current. So that means that the output should be able to go between zero and 3.999 milliamps. So, I've hooked up this circuit. Now I've got all of the inputs connected to ground. So basically I'm inputting zero. Now I have my multimeter hooked up to measure the reference current. So I'm just gonna turn on the voltage supply. And you can see that it's about, now I have the terminals reversed, but it's about one milliamp or so. This is reading microamps. So this is a thousand microamps or one milliamp. Okay, and now I've got uh, the current measurement on the output. So let's see what we get with all zeros. So it looks like we're getting, you know, something like zero milliamps. So let's hook the most significant bit up to a one. Okay, so I've put a one on the most significant bit, so now I'm inputting 2048. So I should be getting roughly half of four times my input. Now, I'm not actually getting that, I'm getting a little more. 
I'm actually getting 2,300 microamps, say 2.4 or so milliamps, which is not exactly two. So that's kind of odd. But let's take a look at what happens if I change the input from 2048 to 1024. I should get roughly half that. Okay, so now I'm getting 1070 microamps. All right, let me half the number again. Okay, and now we're getting 520 microamps. So, so far, approximately so good. Now let's go and have that again. Aha. Uh -huh. So, in fact, we're not getting any current at all. In fact, it's the same with all of the lesser bits. So, with each bit that I put in, I should have been having uh, the current, and that's not actually happening. So, if we look at this diagram, we see something interesting. So we see that the first three bits, which actually work, go into this decoder, and then the other bits go into this um, network over here. So it looks like we actually have uh, the current being set by the, most, the three most significant bits, and then some uh, additional current being put in by this uh, section. And they did that in order to save on resistors, basically. So it looks like the decoder is working, but this section, these logic switches, are not working. Now, I fully admit that while I was putting this circuit together, I may have screwed something up, and I may have actually burned out all of these switches. Um, I don't know how I would have burned out all of the switches, but okay. Um, so... That's kind of suspicious. Uh, now, I do have some new chips coming in, and when I do put, and when I do get them, I will replace this chip with the new chip and see if it reacts the same way. Right, so I've finally received from uh, China, I've received five of these uh, DACs, the replacements. Uh, you can see that they were about $4 a piece. Uh, hopefully they're not, you know, fakes, and uh, it's not unheard of to just take any random, you know, dip of the correct package and uh, replace, the, uh, replace the markings on it. So, let's see. Can we even see the markings? So here are the markings on the chip. Um, it's a little bit worrying that uh, the date codes on them are from 2009. I was actually not aware that AMD made these chips uh, that late. And I'm also not too sure about that logo. Um, but, you know, as long as the part performs like it's supposed to, I guess I don't really mind. So I'm just going to replace this chip with the new chip. and see if it performs better. For all I know, this is a completely different chip. So let's fire up the machine and see what we get on the output. Now, I've got the inputs set for zero output. And so far, that's what I'm seeing, zero output. Now, I'm going to raise one. Okay, and that's actually pretty good. That's um, just about double uh, the reference current, which is 1,000 microamps. So, so far, so great. Now, if I lower that and raise the next least significant bit, I should get roughly half that, 
which is correct. I'm getting 1,000. Now, the interesting thing is that the original chip also did approximately the same thing, but um, it wasn't as accurate as this, so it was actually giving more or less. So this is pretty promising. Now, if I go to the next bit, I should get half of that. Good, I'm getting about 500. Now, this is where the previous chip failed. So I'm going to go to the next bit, and I should get, again, half, and I do. So, so far, this is looking really, really promising. Let's keep going. Next bit, 122, all right. Next bit, 61. And the next bit, 30. And the next bit should be about 15. 19, okay, that's not so great. Uh, but then, you know, at this low amount of current, um, you know, I don't have an op-amp buffer, so it may very well be that the voltmeter itself is actually uh, doing something. And if we go down again, we're getting 8. And we can go one final step, and we get 2. So I'm pretty happy with this. I am going to go ahead and put this chip into the board and replace the board into the machine and see if we get better output. Okay, so now that I've got the boards in, I'm going to turn the machine on and see if we get any better result. And unfortunately, we are not getting any better result. We're getting what we had beforehand, which is the machine would turn on and nothing would happen. So what I'm wondering is if there's maybe some temperature dependent thing going on or maybe there is just a component that's marginal or a joint that's bad or something. Because otherwise we should see something. And I'm looking inside the machine. I don't see anything. Uh, obviously wrong. I see that the... Uh, I see that the spot suppressor light is on, which means that we're not getting any video output. So I guess the next thing to do is, again, pull the boards out and see if we can find anything that would lead to this sort of problem. So the interesting thing is that the last time I got the machine to work is by having the boards out and by actually probing these op amps over here. So the first thing that I'm going to do, I think, is I'm going to clip on to the DAX to make sure that there is output going on. Okay, so let's go ahead and turn the machine off. Okay, and install the clip. Just making sure that that's secure. Okay. For some reason, I can't find the other clip that I used, so I'm just going to be using this one. And let me clip to a ground lead. Okay, and I will clip to one of the input signals. And now I'll turn the machine on and see what we get. Okay, so that's interesting. So in this case, we're now not getting any signal at all.
it almost looks like we are getting a tiny bit of a signal, but yeah, pretty much nothing. So no input. Um, Let's go to the X DAC. Okay, that was just because I pulled the lead off. We'll go to the X DAC. And see what we get. Yeah, okay. Also nothing. So let me just push it some things. You never know, it could be the socketed chips. Ah, there we go. I pressed on this chip right here and it started working. Aha, there we go. I felt, okay. That's pretty good. All right, so I think that uh, this chip was slightly unseated and not making good contact. So let's go and take a look at the front of the machine. And as you can see, we are in business. Everything looks great. The words are clear. If you understand German, it basically says, uh, one coin, two plays, insert coin, all right. So uh, that was the high score list. And there's the battle zone logo. All right. Uh, let's just hit start and see if anything happens. No, okay, so I need to uh, simulate inserting a coin. And this is what it actually looks like from one of the side windows. So you can't actually see something. I think that was the moon going by. So here we have the coin door. I'll just open it up. And somewhere in here, let me move the camera so you can see a little better. Okay, and somewhere in here, we should just be able to pull on something to simulate a coin dropping. And it's usually somewhere around the bottom of the mechanism. There's like a little bit of metal wire. Let's see. Uh, actually, this is the coin mechanism right here. There's a piece of plastic here, and that was one of the things we found in the machine when we first opened it up. Uh, so let's see, uh, how do you make contact? Okay, I don't think that did anything. Uh, let's see, let me see. Okay, I don't know what that is. Uh, let's see. All right, this is some micro switch here. There we go. I think that was a coin. Okay, I hear clicking of a relay. Uh, yeah, okay. So now it's saying in German, uh, press start button. Okay, so there's the start button. And let's see what happens when I start. Ooh. I am I'm moving around. Okay, I'm turning with the joysticks. See anything yet? I'm moving forward with the joysticks. Let's hit the fire button. Okay. 
Oops, apparently I was hit. Interesting, I thought there was supposed to be terrain showing up. You know, like if I turn around. Well, okay, so there's the moon. I can certainly, like, drive towards the moon. Okay, so somebody's shooting at me. Don't just spin in place. I don't know what that means. Okay, anyway, um, it's almost as if yeah, so it's almost as if um, there are some game elements which aren't showing up. I know that there's supposed to be background mountains, uh, and of course you're supposed to be able to see uh, some of these shapes that shoot at you. So I didn't see any of these shapes. I saw the moon. I didn't see the mountains. Uh, and I think I did see missiles being launched from whatever these things are. So, well... That's the next thing to take a look at.